What's the deal with tape counters? Do they have any real meaning? And is there any consistency across different makes and models of cassette recorders? Well, as you can see, I've assembled a collection of different shapes and sizes of cassette tape recorders, so we can try to find out. Not all machines have one, but a tape counter keeps track of how much tape has been used when playing or recording a cassette tape, which is useful for later reference. But except for a small minority of cassette tape recorders which have a real-time counter, the number is arbitrary and may not be consistent across different makes and models of equipment. Popular Mechanics magazine wrote back in 1973, Digital counters are great help in finding your place on the tape, if you jot down the locations of taped items as you record or find them. But counter indications are not standardized, so tape locations logged on one recorder may be irrelevant when playing on another. That's something I realized during my childhood when I recorded a cassette on the home stereo system and I wrote down the counter positions corresponding to each selection on the tape. I beg your pardon. Then I played it on a portable cassette recorder and I noticed the counter readings did not match up. I never promised you a rose garden. Part of the reason for that discrepancy is that most portable cassette recorders drive the tape counter from the supply reel, while most stereo systems and component tape decks drive the tape counter from the take-up reel. And as you can see, when you're at the beginning of the tape, the take-up reel moves much faster than the supply reel, while at the end of the tape it's the opposite. The supply reel moves faster than the take-up reel. So that means, even if all else was equal, a machine that measures the supply reel would only match readings made on a machine that measures the take-up reel at the exact middle of the tape where the two reels are the same diameter. For testing, my benchmark will be these five identical Sony 60-minute HF standard Type 1 cassettes that I bought new back in the year 2000. And my first round of tests will be these five portable cassette recorders. I have a Realistic CTR-75, a Magnavox D6600, and a Sears computer compatible cassette recorder, all from the 1980s. Then I have this professional Panasonic RR830 cassette transcriber, probably from the 1990s. And finally, the C-Crane VersaCorder from the 2000s. So I'm going to reset the counters on all of these machines to zero. Then put one tape into each machine and fast forward it all the way. These are all rewound to the beginning. And I'm going to record the counter positions when it reaches the end of the tape which ideally should be identical, but as I'm pretty sure we'll see, it's not going to be identical. And this one, the spring that opens the door actually broke on me, so I have to kind of pry it open. There's a little flimsy piece of plastic in there and it just snapped off. And finally this professional transcriber which also has a quick erase feature. If you press record and either fast forward or rewind, it'll erase the tape as it is winding it. Okay, the Magnavox was the first one to stop. Obviously, I started these at different times, so you can't compare the speed at which they fast forward. Now the Realistic stopped. The VersaCorder stopped. And this one stopped. And the last one is the Panasonic, which I started at the last. And finally the Panasonic reached the end. Now I'm going to take a look at the counter readings of all these machines. And I also did this test previously so I can keep track of how consistent it is between multiple runs with the same machine and the same tape. The Realistic CTR-75 
stopped at 507. Last time it stopped at 506, so that's pretty consistent. The Magnavox D6600 stopped at 414. Last time it stopped at 415, so again, consistent within one digit. This Sears computer compatible. It's the 1980s. It's the 1980s. And guess what? Guess what? Computers. Computers, mainframes, SCSI ports, DOS. Which is actually made by Sanyo. Stopped at 505. And that was exactly the same it read last time. So that is perfectly consistent. Now the C-Crane VersaCorder stopped at 537. Last time it stopped at 540. So a couple numbers off. And finally this Panasonic stopped at a little bit above 435. And last time it stopped at 419. So that's quite a difference there. I'm sure someone's going to ask, is it possible that these cassettes were not all cut to exactly the same length? And yes, it is possible. But if two of these machines were able to come within one counter digit on multiple tests and one even exactly the same counter reading, not using the same tape in those tests, then I'm sure the differences in length are minimal. But to my point, there was quite a difference in these counter readings between these different portable cassette recorders. The lowest was this Magnavox, which stopped at 414, and the highest was this VersaCorder, which stopped at 537. The only two recorders which had almost identical readings were the Realistic and Sears, which came out to 507 and 505, respectively. So tapes recorded on these two machines would have matching counter readings, but not with any of the other machines I tested. But one thing I noticed all these portal machines had in common, despite their differences in age and manufacturer, is that the counter is driven by the supply reel, not the take-up reel. And the way you can tell that is if you fast forward with no tape inserted, and you notice the counter does not advance, but if you rewind, then the counter moves. For round two of testing, I have cassette decks and stereo systems with mechanical tape counters, an IMA PS2500, a Sankyo STD2000, a Sound Design TX0868, and a Pioneer CTF615. Then on another camera off to my side is my 1986 Sanyo GXT255 stereo system. And again, I have five identical Sony HF. 60 mini cassettes. I'm going to fast forward. Oops, wrong button. This one you load it in like that. It's kind of a weird 1970s super fiddly design. Come on. There we go. Fast forward. This one at least is conventional. But it's noisy. Okay, the I must stop first, but I started it first, so it had a head start. Next is the sound design. Then the Pioneer, which has auto stop on fast forward and rewind. Then the Sanyo stopped. And finally, the Sankyo stopped. And the results are 443 on the Sanyo. The first time I ran the test, it came out to 444, so that's within one digit. The IMA is reading 434, and the first time it read 435, so that's pretty consistent. The Sankyo is reading 454, which is exactly the same as the first time I did the test. The Pioneer is reading 493. The first time I did the test, it read 490, so that's a couple digits off. And finally, the sound design is reading 458, and the first time I did the test, it read 459. So again, that's pretty close. So if these machines, the counter readings varied from 434 on the IMA to 493 on the Pioneer, compared to most of the portables, which are reading in the 500 plus range. And one thing all of these decks have in common, unlike the portables, is that the counter is driven by the take-up reel, not the supply reel. 
So if I fast forward, even with no tape inserted, the counter will go up. And this time, the only two decks whose counter readings were close enough that I would consider them to be interchangeable is the Sankyo, which read 454, and the Sound Design, which read 458. And check out the eject on this one. To be fair, it originally had rubber bumpers in there to stop the tape from shooting out, but they disintegrated with age, so I had to remove them, and now it shoots out the tape. Now we move on to relatively high-end cassette decks from the late 1980s to late 1990s, and these all have four-digit tape counters, which right away tells you that the readings we get are probably not going to be compatible with any of the previous machines that had three digit counters. But you notice these all have electronic tape counters. So you would think by the time these were introduced, they would have reached some kind of standard between different manufacturers and models. So let's find out. I have a Pioneer TD7. This is Japanese mark. Pretend you didn't see that. I have a Pioneer TD7. It's a Japanese market model. A Nakamichi Cassette Deck 2, very imaginative name there. A JVC TDR431 and a Denon DRM24HX. So I'll load our test cassettes again. The Sony HF 60 minute cassettes, all fully rewound. So here we go, start those two decks, and those two decks. Okay, the Pioneer stop first, then the Nakamichi, then the Denon, and the JVC is going to be last. And there it goes. Okay, now this is interesting. The JVC reads 1647. The first time I ran the test, it read 1643. The Denon reads 1646, almost exactly the same. And the first time I tried it, it read 1649. And here the Nakamichi reads 1644. The first time it read 1648. So they're all within a couple digits. But the Pioneer is the odd one out at 2470 which is exactly the same as the first time I did the test. So these three different decks from different manufacturers, Nakamichi, Denon, and JVC, are all reading within a couple digits of each other. So that's close enough that the counter readings between these decks would be compatible. So it does look like they must have reached some kind of agreement, except for this Pioneer, which is quite a bit higher. And just like last time on all of these, the tape counter is driven by the take-up reel, not the supply reel. Now let's see if that consistency carries over to these double cassette decks from the 90s and 2000s. I have a Pioneer CTW616DR, a TACW890R, and a Philips FC931. And I actually found one more Sony 60-minute HF tape, so I can do both sides of all three decks. Yes, that one has a squeaky door. And these are slow to open. So six identical Sony 60 minute HF tapes loaded and we're ready to go. This one only shows one counter at a time, but it is keeping track of them. You just have to select which one you want to view. There goes the Phillips. Then the Pioneer. And the TAC is still going. It's almost silent when it's winding, so it's taking this time and doing it quietly.
Okay, there goes the Tiak. It took quite a bit longer than the other two decks. First the Pioneer, 1727 on the left, 1722 on the right, which is within the range it read the first time I did the test. Then the Tiak W890R, 1683 on the left, 1679 on the right. And again, that's within a couple digits of the first time I did the test. And finally the Philips, the company who invented the cassette tape, 2474 on the left, 2474 on the right, perfectly in match. And the first time it read 2481 on the left and 2467 on the right. So it got more consistent between the sides the second time. And interestingly, this is close enough to that first Pioneer I tested, which read 2470, that the counter readings between this and that would be compatible. But this other Pioneer is clearly not even close to the first Pioneer we tested, and not really similar to any other decks in this test. And the TX is kind of close to those three decks we tested, which all read in the 1640s. This is around 1680. So pretty similar, but not enough that I would consider the counter readings between them to be compatible. <laughs> And now finally, two cassette decks which you can buy new today. The Marantz Professional PMD300CP and the TXW1200, both of which I've done reviews of. The Marantz only has a tape counter on the right side deck. And unusually for a component tape deck like this, it's driven by the supply reel, not the take-up reel. And it's also only a three-digit electronic tape counter instead of four-digit like all the other electronic tape counters I've shown so far, including the ones on this TX W1200. So now I'll press fast forward on the Brants and on the TX. That was the TX stopping on the left and right side decks. And that was the Marantz. Now this is interesting. Unlike that older TX deck I tested earlier, the W890R, this new W1200 conforms to what I would call the de facto standard that we saw of those three other decks from Nakamichi, JVC, and Denon, which were all reading in the 1640s. And here you see 1645 and 1644. So it is following the closest we've seen so far to an industry standard for counter readings. And the first time I did the test, it read 1642 on both decks, so it's pretty consistent. And now here is the Marantz with its oddball three-digit electronic tape counter reading 821, which doesn't really correspond to anything else we've tested so far, except if you double it, then it would read 1642, Almost identical to the TX and those three other decks from Nakamichi, JVC, and Denon. So it's reading half of the de facto industry standard, except that's measuring the supply reel, not the take up reel. So the readings would only correspond if you double it in the middle of the tape. And the first time I did the test, it read 824. So again, pretty consistent. With these cassette decks that conform to what I call the de facto standard, the tape counter advances by one digit for every half rotation of the take-up spindle. So if I let it play for five rotations, the counter reads 10. So I appear to have discovered a de facto standard for tape counters with cassette decks from the 1980s to today from multiple different manufacturers having virtually identical readings. But was there ever an attempt to create an official industry standard for tape counters? Well, if you've seen cassette recorders designed for educational use from brands like Caliphone and Aki, you may have noticed that their tape counters say 2x counter next to them. Back here we have a three-digit tape counter that is marked two times counter. And it turns out that 2x counter means it's using an ANSI standard called 2x. The next mystery to figure out is what is an ANSI standard called 2x? Good question, Clyde Sight. So I did some research and I found the answer. The 2x counter was an ICIA recommended practice for compact cassette equipment. 
that was the International Communications Industries Association, which is now known as AVIXA, Audiovisual and Integrated Experience Association, and they said the 2x counter indicates relative location on a tape and should advance one digit for every two revolutions of the supply spindle. So therefore, the de facto standard I discovered is not conforming to this 2x counter specification because all of those tape decks drive the counter from the take-up reel rather than the supply reel. I don't have any of those cassette recorders designed for educational use which say 2x counter on them. But luckily that specification tells me everything I need to know to check whether any of the machines I do have conform to that specification. All I need to do is put in a tape, preferably near the end so it doesn't take so long, reset the counter, and let it play for 10 rotations of the supply reel. And if this machine corresponds to that 2x counter specification, we should get a counter reading of 5. So the little marker is right there. So I'm going to count 10 rotations of the supply reel. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And we have a reading of 6. So no, this one does not conform to that 2x counter specification. Next is the Magnavox. Reset the counter. The little marker is right there and we're going to count 10 rotations. And this one has a reading of 5, so this Magnavox does conform to that 2x counter specification. Next is this Sears computer compatible cassette tape recorder made by Sanyo. And because it's so difficult to see through that window, I'm going to leave the door open so I can actually see it. So the marker is right there. I'm going to reset the counter and I'm going to let it play for 10 rotations. Okay, that was 10 rotations, and we get a reading of 6. So not quite 2x counter certified. Next is a C-Crane VersaCorder made by Sanjian. And you probably can't see it, but I can see that the marker on the tape is right there. So I'm going to keep an eye on it, reset the counter, and let it play for 10 rotations. That was 10, and it's reading between 6 and 7. So no, this is not 2x counter certified. Here's that Panasonic Professional Cassette Transcriber, which I'm sure cost a bunch of money when it was new. So I sure hope this conforms to that specification. Reset the counter, the marker is right there. I'm going to let it play for 10 rotations. Okay, that was 10 rotations, and ta-da, it does read 5. So this does conform to the 2x counter specification. And finally, the new Marantz PMD300CP, which does drive the tape counter from the supply reel, rather than the take-up reel. And I removed the door to give better viewing of it. The marker is right there, the counter is at 0. I'm going to let it play for 10 rotations. And it reads 10, so this would be a 1x counter instead of a 2x counter because it's measuring every rotation instead of going up by one digit for every two rotations of the supply spindle. So whatever readings you get on this machine, if you divide it in half, you would get a reading that corresponds to the 2x counter specification. So that attempt by the ICIA to create an official industry standard for tape counter readings does not appear to have been a success because out of six machines I tested which could possibly conform to that specification, only two of them did. One probably by design and one probably by coincidence. <laughs> So hopefully that made this video worthwhile to watch to discover that there were at least two attempts at creating standards for tape counter readings on cassette equipment. One de facto standard adopted by various Japanese manufacturers 
in the 1980s and is still used today by TIAC and TASCAM. And one attempt at creating an official industry standard by the ICIA, which never saw any widespread use outside of equipment meant for the educational market and which can only apply to portable recorders due to the way it is measuring the supply reel instead of the take up reel. But feel free to repeat the test I've shown in this video on your own cassette tape equipment to check whether it conforms to the de facto standard I demonstrated or the ICIA 2X counter specification. Yeah, I, I brought back those cassettes I borrowed. I thought you might need them. Thanks. Nice. 